Thank you very much. Uh, the title of tonight's talk is The Coming War with Russia. Not that I think that is desirable or inevitable, but it certainly is possible and more possible now than it was 10 years ago since the Russian interventions in Georgia, Ukraine and Syria. Those interventions are a warning, a warning that we should not be complacent, not a call to militarism and confrontation. Now, my critique of Russia is from a democratic left-wing standpoint, not from the standpoint of Western governments or military leaders. I'm a very fierce critic of both the United States, Britain, and indeed other Western powers in terms of their military interventions and policies. But I can also see how Russia now echoes in significant degrees elements of traditional Western imperialism and how it is mirroring many of the negative military and international policies that have historically been pursued by the West. Unlike many on the left, I don't say that just because of Western disasters like Iraq, that Russia deserves a free pass. I don't fall for the hypocritical one-sided left-wing politics, which rightly condemns Western imperialism, but not its Russian equivalent. I think that looking at the internal repression inside Russia is a useful starting point and gives an indication of the kind of state we are dealing with. Dealing with both uh, with day-to-day -day relations and indeed dealing with on the global scale. Uh, whatever Russia once was or became, it now is certainly an authoritarian police state. It's not as bad as Russia or the old Soviet Union under Stalin, but it does embody many of the same characteristics of repression of Russian citizens. Uh, I would say that it is borderline fascist, exhibiting many of the traits of fascist states. Now, it's good that the left criticises Trump, a very dangerous US president. But what is disturbing is the silence of most on the left when it comes to Putin, who is roughly 10 times worse. So let's take a look at Russia today under Putin. First of all, there is negligible political freedom. It is almost impossible to register new political parties and for them to compete in elections. The registration process is so complex, so restrictive, that no new political parties have been able to register in recent years. And therefore we cannot say in any circumstances that elections in Russia are free or fair. They massively fail generally accepted standards of free and fair elections. If we look at the media, we see the Russian media is now mostly under state control. Nearly all the independent media has progressively been shut down or silenced. You had a handful of journals like Moscow Times that survive, but with a tiny readership, they don't get out to most of the far reaches of the Russian Federation. To all intents and purposes, the media in Russia is under state control. You can't get any voice on Russian TV or radio, or indeed the Russian press, unless it is Kremlin approved. Very occasionally, 
a dissident voice may slip through, but it's exceedingly rare. So it's therefore not surprising that President Putin is very popular. Because the only voice, the only narrative, the only story about what he is doing is that that is being put out by his state-sanctioned media. Um, It means that alternative voices, dissident voices, are simply not being heard. Take the right to protest. It isn't non-existent, but it's very severely restricted. You have to get all kinds of permissions to conduct protests, which will often be denied. And if you do go ahead with those protests, if they're not towing the Kremlin line, the chances are that those protests will be violently broken up by the police or by ultra-nationalist, pro-Kremlin, neo-Nazi groups who are acting with the de facto blessing of the state. So if we take a look at what is currently the right to protest in Russia, you will see that just a week ago, on the April 29th, Open Russia organised a protest in St. Petersburg which resulted in dozens of people arrested for merely critiquing the Putin regime and appealing for the right of other candidates to stand against him. Uh, This was the uh, three days after the Kremlin banned the independent political movement Open Russia, describing it as, quote, an undesirable organisation. Thousands, hundreds of thousands or more of their protest materials were confiscated by the police. Back in March, opposition leader and senior Putin critic, critic Alexei Navalny, organised one of the biggest mass protests in many years, in Moscow. A perfectly lawful, peaceful protest, which is guaranteed under the Russian constitution, yet a thousand people, including Navalny, were arrested. Um, Back in December 2015, the peaceful democracy and anti-war activist Ildar Dadin was jailed for violating the country's new laws, which uh, basically uh, virtually prohibit public assemblies. His crime had been holding one-man protest or protest with a handful of other people, again, perfectly lawful under the Russian constitution, which guarantees the right to protest and freedom of expression. But he ended up in prison... Uh, for that protest and for others that he engaged in uh, subsequently. And there was a big campaign, which eventually, not long ago, got him released, but then he was re-arrested just days or weeks afterwards. Many of you will be familiar with the uh, Bolotnaya Square protests in June 2012, um, which were protesting against the... Russian elections and the allegations of that they weren't free and fair. Um, hundreds of people were arrested. And in June 2012, as a response to those mass protests, the Kremlin fast-tracked new laws imposing very strict rules and heavy fines on protests. Uh, including fines of up to one year's salary for an unsanctioned protest. And of course, to get a sanctioned protest, you have to get the agreement of the authorities. And the authorities will, eight or nine times out of ten, refuse to sanction a protest. So in effect, protest is banned because protest is governed by the state and most applications are refused. Um, 
The new anti-protest legislation was Article 212.1 of the Russian Criminal Code, which in particular punishes multiple violations um, of the anti-protest laws and was one of the legislations that was used to charge and jail Ildar Dadin. Um, Less people think that the Russian state is only going after, you know, pro-Western right-wingers. In July 2014, the leader of the Socialist Left Front, and one of the major organisers of street protests, um, Sergei Ulitsov, uh, alongside other colleagues, were sentenced to four and a half years in a penal colony for organising mass protests in 2011, 2012 and 2013. Of the 28 protesters charged uh, with, in connection with these demonstrations, 12 were given prison sentences ranging from 30 months to four and a half years. It's very, very indicative of the way things are going and the crackdown on civil society organisations who are mostly protesting against corruption, against unfair elections, against uh, human rights violations. They are met with the full force of the state. They're not shot dead. They're not, um, you know, usually jailed without trial. They go through the process, the charade of a trial, and they get these very heavy sentences. The same fate has fallen anti-war protesters. In August 2014, about a dozen activists were arrested while protesting against Russia's intervention in eastern Ukraine. Um, uh, These protests um, had involved things like simply lighting candles in memory of those killed. Uh, And people were detained uh, left, right and centre. There's also been targeted assaults on trade union activists. Uh, The Airline Pilots Union um, won a successful case, amazingly, in the courts uh, against the hazardous conditions of work and night work they were being forced to pursue. And the response of the Russian government was to arrest their leaders in 2013 on charges of, quote, provocation. Um, Another instance... uh, a leader of the miners, you know, the trade union for mine workers, was sentenced to six years in a penal colony on trumped-up charges of drug dealing in 2008. Um, this is a, a classic example of the kind of fabricated allegations uh, that are often imposed upon political dissidents and labour activists. Um, he was jailed under this fabricated charge after his successful attempts to organise workers at diamond mines in the northern province of Saka in Russia. He actually succeeded in setting up independent trade unions to get rights for the workers to defend their position and wages and conditions, and he got this trumped-up charge. Um, So, quite clearly, we are seeing a grave diminution of basic civil liberties and rights and freedoms in Russia today. I personally have witnessed examples of this repression. Uh, I went to Moscow five times between 2006 and 2011 to support LGBT activists who were attempting to hold a Moscow gay pride parade, which, like any other parade, is perfectly lawful. It's constitutionally guaranteed right in the Russian constitution, Um, and we suffered the same fate, same fate as everyone else. First of all, the Moscow mayor declared that the uh, march, the protest, was illegal, unsanctioned, and warned that anybody who tried to march would be arrested. We went to City Hall to deliver a letter protesting against the ban, 
And as soon as we arrived, I was there supporting the Russian activists. You know, my, my role was simply to support their struggle. It was, the struggle of the whole campaign was being led by Russian LGBT activists. I went with them to City Hall and we tried to present this letter to the mayor's office. The response was, we were swooped upon by the city police and the riot police. They sent in snatch squads to arrest the key Russian leaders. And the rest of us ran for our lives, and I was one of the ones who got away. But as I got away, I looked back and I saw that uh, in the distance, about 200 metres away, the police had been holding back um, vast crowds of Russian Orthodox fanatics, uh, ultra-nationalists and neo-Nazis who were chanting slogans like, Moscow is not Sodom, death to the Sodomites. The police were holding them back, but then at a certain point the police just melted their lines away and those people were free to chase us and do what they will. Um, I thought I'd got away further down Tverskaya, the main street in Moscow, uh, and was speaking to a group of journalists when I was surrounded by a whole group of these neo-Nazis and ultra-nationalists. Um, and then when I was talking to a particular journalist, one sneaked through the crowd and punched me in the face. Um, I wasn't knocked out, but I was almost knocked unconscious and eventually fell down and then I was kicked and beaten when I was on the ground in full view of the Moscow City Police and the Oman, the riot police. They stood there with folded arms and watched. And when I was beginning to lose consciousness, they stepped in and arrested me, allowing the assailants to walk free. And when I was in the police bus, and they put me in a police bus with some neo-Nazis, deliberately to intimidate. But I saw the man who punched me in the face walk up to police lines, show some kind of ID and be waved through. So my presumption is, or was, that either he was a plainclothes police officer, or he was a neo-Nazi but acting in cahoots with the police, with their blessing and approval. And my colleagues told me later that they had identified the buses on which the neo-Nazis had arrived at, by City Hall. The buses were identical to the buses that had brought in the riot police. The buses that brought in the neo-Nazis were allowed to park in an area where no public vehicles are allowed. So work it out for yourself. There is at some level, some higher level, collusion between neo-Nazis, ultra-nationalists and Russian Orthodox fanatics uh, and the uh, Moscow city police and the riot squad. Um, in the end, because I had some possible brain and eye damage, I was taken to a hospital and um, uh, as I was waiting to be treated, someone came out to me and whispered in my ear in broken English, do not let them treat you. They will poison you or subject, because they want to do an x-ray, they will subject you to a massive overdose of radiation. So I refused um, the police tried to pressure me to have the treatment, but I refused, and eventually they relented. I think I was very lucky. Eventually, I spent some hours in the police station, and thankfully, having a British passport and someone having the full mind to phone the British embassy, I was eventually released. My Russian colleagues remained, some of them remained in the station for, in the cells for 24 hours, and they end up being taken to court and find. But that's really indicative of the kind of police state that exists in Russia today. There are many other things. Uh, nowadays, um, non-governmental organizations in Russia who receive even a small amount 
of overseas funding. They might receive funding, say, from Human Rights Watch or Amnesty International uh, or something, some organisation like that. They are now forced to register as, quote, foreign agents. Um, there's a huge explosion in Russia of nationalist and fascist militias. Again, with the tacit approval of the state, um, these militias drill with weapons. They give members training in weapons, training how to slit people's throats, decapitate people, break their necks. And there are not hundreds, but thousands and tens of thousands of people in these state-sanctioned militias. It is a, a military force within the state, separate from the state, but operating under the aegis of the state. We also see a, a big increase in anti-Semitism in Russia. Not necessarily overtly sanctioned by the state, but tolerated by the state. So little or no action will be taken against people who preach against Jews and who threaten and menace Jews. But the big new enemy within is, of course, lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender people. They are the enemy within. Um, they are the useful scapegoat for the state. Everything is down to the problem of the gays. Um, it offers a very useful distraction from corruption, economic mismanagement and abuses of human rights. You'll all be familiar with the new anti-gay law that was passed in 2013, uh, which prohibited the promotion of, quote, non-traditional sexual relations. Um, people have been arrested and convicted for merely holding a sign saying homosexuality is normal. Organisations that provide advice and support to suicidal young LGBT kids have been arrested and prosecuted under this law. Uh, all across Russia, teachers and university lecturers have been sacked from their jobs simply because they're gay. Not because they've promoted homosexuality or advocated homosexuality, simply because they are gay. Um, there are other echoes of fascist regimes Fashion regimes often promote motherhood, the family, the church. And so does Putin's Russia. You know, the promotion of motherhood and the family is a really big thing. A mother who has seven or more children will receive the order of parental glory from President Putin. There's a big anti-abortion crusade going on to try and discourage and shame women from having abortions. Recently, there's been a partial decriminalisation of domestic violence. So women who are beaten by their husbands no longer have the strong protections they had some time ago. And this is in a country where every year 10,000 women are murdered by their partners in domestic violence incidents. 10,000. Now, of course, you might ask yourself, why? Why is this this promotion of uh, motherhood and parenthood? Why is there this crackdown on non-reproductive homosexuality? I would say it's partly because Putin's vision is to make Russia strong again, and he believes that to do so, the population must increase. Exactly the same thing of Hitler and the Nazis. Their idea was to increase the German population, so they cracked down on all non-reproductive sexualities. Uh, the idea is you create a new generation, a bigger new generation of workers to produce the goods required and, of course, more soldiers for the armed forces. It's also related to the fact that there is a very close relationship between the Kremlin and the Russian Orthodox Church. Basically, there's a deal going on. Now, the Russian Orthodox Church supports Putin, and in return, he supports them. That's why his regime has been light on domestic violence, tough on abortion, very keen to promote motherhood and big families. 
I suppose the prosecution of Pussy Riot was a, 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 one of the best known examples of how the church and the state work together. There's also been a huge wave of assassinations of Putin critics and opposition activists. Um, roughly about 80 opposition activists, journalists, lawyers and human rights defenders have died in suspicious circumstances since Putin came to power. And these are just the ones we know about. You know, suspicious deaths, if not outright murders, are happening in far-flung reaches of the Russian Federation, which never get reported. But let's just think of just a handful of the better-known ones. Alexander Litvinenko, who was murdered in London in 2006. It's one thing to murder Putin critics in Moscow or St. Petersburg, but to murder them here in a foreign country, that is really Putin crossing a red line and shows that he believes that he can act with impunity. That he believes the West is so feeble that he can get away with it. There was also, the same year, the case of Anna Polotvitskaya, uh, who had been a critic of Putin's war in Chechnya and the crackdown on civil liberties. Initially, in 2004, she had been poisoned, but amazingly survived. And then, when she did survive, the killers came for her and shot her dead in 2006. Sergei Magnitsky, who had shone a lot a light on corruption by the Putin regime, exposing the embezzlement of hundreds of millions of dollars equivalent, um, was arrested, tortured and murdered in prison in 2009. Almost certainly with the connivance and approval of Putin and other senior Russian leaders. And then they had the gall to put his corpse on trial. And he was found, he, the corpse was found guilty in a trial that subsequently happened only a year or so ago. Boris Nemtsov, shot dead in the Kremlin in 2015. You know, the liberal critic, the opposition politician, shot dead in the Kremlin. Uh, Denis Vorokhinov, a former member of the Communist Party of Russia, who had become a critic of Putin and his regime, uh, was gunned to death in Kiev, where he'd gone to seek asylum earlier this year. Nikolai Gor Gorokov, the family lawyer for Sergei Minitsky, was thrown off the top of his apartment building. Amazingly and miraculously, he survived. So you can see, this is more than accident. This is more than just unusual things. This is part of a pattern. It is the pattern of a police state. And we are seeing today in Russia a return to the gulags, the secret prison network mostly in Siberia, but in other parts of the Federation as well, where thousands of people, some of them political prisoners, are detained in subhuman conditions. Ildar Dadan was taken to one of them, and he smuggled out detailed accounts of the kind of abuses that were going on in those secret prisons. The lack of adequate food, warmth, clothing the lack of adequate medical attention, the brutalisation of prisoners by guards and sometimes by other gangs within the prison system. So if you take all these different dimensions in their whole, I would say that the internal repression in Russia today echoes very similar that of fascist regimes in the past of General Franco in Spain, 
and Pinochet in Chile, of Marcos in the Philippines and of the Greek colonels during the 60s and 70s. The parameters, the dimensions, the scale of oppression is very, very, very similar. Now internationally, Russia is moving into new territory with the aim of destabilizing the West. I'm not a great fan of the West, I'm a very strong critic of the West, but I'm also a strong critic of those who want to use subterfuge and sabotage to undermine and destabilize our democracies. There's more and more evidence emerging that Russia is clandestinely supporting and funding far-right parties in Europe, like the Front National in France, Jobbik in Hungary, and Golden Dawn in Greece. And the aim is very clear, to destabilise these European states. There's also an escalating use of cyber warfare on Western governments and military. None of these actions are motivated by harmless intentions. None are motivated or can be justified in terms of self-defence. Russia does have a right to defend itself, like any country, but these actions go way, way, way beyond that. What we are seeing globally is the rise of a new Russian militarism, which is echoed and witnessed by its rearmament and by the increasing switch away from defensive weapon systems to increasingly long-range offensive military capabilities. Now, you could say that during the Cold War, Russia had many of these offensive capabilities. That's true. But then when there was a period post the demise of the Soviet Union where those kinds of weapon systems and those kinds of um, uh, long-range capabilities faded. And, you know, Russia seemed to be much more geared towards a defensive capability. But that is definitely beginning to change. And in many ways echoes the kind of, um, you know, offensive long-range military capacities that countries like Britain and the United States have historically held, had and used to act as policemen around the world. So, by 2015, the Russian defence budget had more than tripled compared to 2005. A 300% increase in Russian defence, quote-unquote, military spending, um, compared to 10 years previous. Russia now spends 5.4% of its GDP on the military, one of the highest levels of any country. Um, if we look at the nature and mix of its spending, the kinds of weapons it is uh, pursuing, in just one year, 2015, its ground forces were equipped with 1,000 172 new tanks and armoured vehicles. You've got to ask yourself, what is it that threatens Russia that it needs those kinds of weapon systems? When it comes to nuclear weapons, the Russian nuclear arsenal is the largest in the world, estimated at over 7,000 warheads um, deployed in a variety of uh, ways, including uh, submarines. Um, when we look at the composition of the army today, uh, it now has nearly 3,000 main battle tanks, over 1,200 reconnaissance vehicles, heading for 6,000 armoured infantry fighting vehicles, and so on and so on and so on. These are not the weapon systems you would expect, or certainly not the volume of weapons you would expect 
from a nation that was purely concerned with self-defense. These are weapon systems much more geared towards an offensive military capacity. And you have to ask yourself, what or who is Russia defending itself from? Why does it need all these weapons? You can ask the same of Trump. He's, he's, Trump is planning to massively increase US military spending as well, and that's equally deplorable. But it doesn't excuse or justify or explain benignly what Russia is doing. Last year, the defense minister in Russia stated that the army was expecting to receive a further 900 tanks and armored vehicles, along with an additional 170 aircraft. You judge a nation by what it's spending its money on, what it's buying with its money. And when a nation spends so much on the military, you've got to ask why. When it spends so much on military which is geared towards an offensive military capability, we need to ask why. These are not the actions of a state that is solely concerned with self-defence. And of course, we have seen the practical consequences since Putin came to power. There were the successive Chechnya wars in the 1990s, the intervention in Georgia in 2008, the interventions in Ukraine and the annexing of Crimea in 2014. In Syria, Russia intervened to defend and save a fascist dictatorship, President Bashar al-Assad. The mass aerial bombardment of civilian areas in Syria by the Russian Air Force echoes the Nazi war crimes against Guernica in 1937. They are war crimes under international law. To indiscriminately bomb civilian areas is a war crime under the Geneva Conventions. To recklessly target areas where there's a probability and likelihood of destroying schools, places of worship and hospitals is a war crime. And Russia, together with Assad, has done all those things. Moreover, in the UN Security Council, time and time again, Russia has blocked peace plans, de-escalation attempts, civilian safe havens, and so on. Um, so where does this leave us? First of all, Putin is an oppressor of his own people. He has a police state which is crushing the Russian people. He has public opinion on his side only because the media is controlled by him and people simply do not know what is happening, either within the country or what Russia is doing outside it. Because there is blanket mass censorship. And when you have a state like that, when you have a state that is so tightly controlled, where civil liberties and free speech are so heavily suppressed, then that state is very easily manipulated. Or that state is very easy, it's very easy to manipulate the population and very easy for that state to be abused to pursue military adventures abroad. I would say that right now the threat from Russia is very limited. It isn't going to go out and invade bits of Africa or Latin America, but it certainly is um, flexing its muscle on its periphery. And I think a lot of the reason for the intervention in Syria is probably to safeguard the Russian base at Latakia. Um, again, because that was Russia's presence in the Mediterranean. Now, the United States and Britain has the same kind of geopolitical global reach, equally wrong, equally reprehensible, but quite clearly Russia is replicating it. Quite clearly Russia is seeking to uh, pursue the same kind of great power politics and military reach. Um, but what we need to think about is not immediately here and now, although there are issues, as I've mentioned, that we need to be concerned about, we need to also think about 
how this military power, allied with this internal repression, could be used or abused in the future. For any state wishing to engage in aggressive belligerent war, to muzzle its own population is central. That's a key requirement. To have control of domestic opinion is vital. And that is what Putin is intending. What he's doing is not classical imperialism. It's what I call a version of neo-imperialism. And we need to be, I think, on our guard. Um, we should not be alarmist. We should not pursue another new arms race. We should not be confrontational against Russia. But we need to set down red lines. We need to support those people who are standing up against Russian great power chauvinism and neo-imperialism and be prepared that possibly in the future it may spread to open war. Hopefully it will not come to that. And we must not react in ways that ratchet up, ratchet up the um, tension wherever possible. So, for example, in Syria, I, despite all my criticisms of Assad and Putin, support negotiation with the regime to try and de-escalate the conflict. I don't think we should have barged in to a military confrontation with Putin in Syria. That would have been very dangerous and would have been exactly what he wanted. Because the more overseas adventures he does, it seems the more popular support he has at home. He plays the nationalist card, plays the card that he's defending Russia and Russia's interests, and the public lap it up. So I think, you know, it's a, it's a very difficult situation to strike a balance between taking a stand against what he is seeking to do, but also not ending up in a new arms race, a new Cold War, and in fact even the fear of a new hot war. Um... The Russian state is the enemy, not the Russian people. We must hold out our hands to the Russian people as friends and seek collaboration and cooperation. We must make that very, very important distinction. There are many wonderful people in Russia, um, ordinary civilians and people in civil society organisations who share the same kind of humanitarian, democratic and human rights values as we do. Sadly, they don't get much of a voice, but we need to stand with them against the regime. Thank you.